So hi everyone, I'm uh, Pietro, and uh, this, uh, today I'm going to present uh, the work I did uh, at the VUSEC. And the title of the paper is uh, Gram Pawning Unit. Um, I worked on this paper with uh, Cristiano, Herbert, and Cave. So let's start with a brief summary. <coughs> so we start looking at uh, microarchitecture attacks from the web, and uh, the first thing we look at was uh, what are the major challenges in implementing these kind of attacks. And uh, the first thing that uh, you could see is that if you want, uh, when we say major uh, microarchitectural attacks, we mainly mean uh, raw hammer attacks and side channels. And uh, when we want to build this kind of attacks, the major challenges that uh, we uh, incur um, when we want to prevent it from the web are high resolution timers and uh, cache eviction in the case of uh, raw hammer attacks. Now, high resolution timers were actually available in the past uh, from the web, but uh, due to uh, previous attacks, uh, browser vendors started disabling these kind of timers. Whereas in the case of uh, cache eviction, it has always be, uh, been a big problem because uh, it's uh, actually quite difficult to, uh, reach the front, to reach DRAM uh, without uh, having a CL flash instruction, for instance. And this is even a bigger problem in the case of uh, ARM platforms because uh, there is no proof as of now of a uh, um, uh, attack from uh, JavaScript. And uh, what we thought was, uh, okay, well, when you look at this, uh, the, the, the thing that is common with uh, all the other attacks is that uh, all of them, they use the CPU as a duck vector. And so the idea we had was uh, it's about time that someone looked into uh, a different attack vector and we switched to uh, our threat model from the CPU to the GPU. And it turns out that uh, once you move uh, the threat model to the GPU, we can actually implement all these kind of attacks uh, and not only implement them, but we can bypass all the challenges and the mitigations that uh, has been introduced in the past. So the result is that uh, we can finally implement uh, an end-to-end -end ROM exploit from JavaScript uh, and we can do this even on, on the more challenging uh, ARM platforms. So the goal for this presentation is going to be for me to introduce you to uh, our end-to-end uh, -end exploit and guide you through uh, how we build this. And uh, the threat model in this case is going to be uh, a smartphone, so an Android smartphone, and uh, a website uh, with an attacker that has uh, control over this website. And it can run its own uh, JavaScript code and uh, WebGL code on the GPU. Uh, our test set was a Nexus 5 because uh, we had that one in the lab and uh, we decided to, uh, uh, to approach that, uh, uh, that phone at the end. So let's have a bit of introduction about Rammer. Uh, what's Rammer? Rammer is a bug that affects most of the uh, modern DRAM chips, and uh, it relies on the fact that uh, capacitors that store data in DRAM uh, leak charges over time. And uh, researchers have discovered that uh, if, you want to, if you access memory following a specific access pattern, so you usually choose the two aggressor rows with a victim row in the middle, if you follow a specific access pattern and you do it fast enough, eventually you may be able to trigger bit flips. Now, if these bit flips are random, it's not really a big deal, but uh, the thing is these bit flips are actually reproducible. So once you find a bit, a bit flip, uh, you can actually reuse it uh, later on to, uh, to compromise uh, sensitive data. So what do we need to build this kind of attacks? Uh, using a bunch of ingredients, uh, which uh, we call attacker primitives. And uh, the primitives that we need are, uh, first of all, DRAM access because, uh, of course, you want to uh, uh, trigger the bitflips on uh, DRAM. Then uh, you need uh, to bypass the caches, so you need to get uh, a fast enough access to the memory. And eventually, you need the contiguous memory, because, as we said, we need the, the two uh, aggressor rows and the victim row in the middle. So we're going to go through every single one of them, and uh, eventually we're going to show you how we can use them to uh, build uh, our end-to-end -end exploit. So let's start from DRAM access. To understand how we get uh, DRAM access, we need to understand how the GPU works. And the GPU has the purpose of uh, aiding the, the rendering pipeline. And the rendering pipeline runs in four main steps. At the beginning, you have uh, the, the, GP, the, the CPU providing uh, vertices as inputs for the GPU. And uh, afterwards, uh, these uh, vertices uh, are run through the vertex shader, which uh, perform geometrical computations over uh, these uh, vertices. Afterwards, uh, at the end of the vertex shader, you will have a, a polygon, which is uh, basically a grid uh, of uh, the fragments, which are basically the pixels inside the polygon. And uh, after, you will run uh, the fragment shader over every single one of these uh, pixels. Now, when you want to run the fragment shader, when, when you run the fragment shader, most of the time, the, the, purpose, of, uh, the purpose of this uh, fragment shader is to color the, the pixels. And you usually want to do it uh, by using uh, some textures, because maybe you want to draw, I don't know, a wooden chair or something like that. So the fragment shader has the, the possibility of uh, accessing uh, external data in the form of textures. So once you get the data, you uh, run the fragment shader, uh, you get uh, your output as a wooden triangle in this case, and eventually you send it to the frame buffer, which is the screen uh, of uh, your uh, smartphone in this case. So let's have a look at how this happens from the GPU. 
Uh, now we have, uh, we can see that we have uh, the vertices and textures stored in DRAM, and uh, these uh, units here on the GPU are the stream processor, which are the one in charge of uh, running the shaders. And uh, what it, the GPU does is uh, it starts running the vertex shader on the stream processors, and uh, it outputs the, um, the polygons uh, uh, at the end of the vertex shader. And afterwards, uh, once, once it's time to run the fragment shader, it will query the texture processor, which are these ones uh, that I just highlighted, to query the textures from DRAM. Now they'll query the textures, they will run uh, the fragment shader, fill in the pixels, and eventually send the output to the frame buffer. Now, as you can see, we have uh, three main uh, access points to DRAM, and these are uh, reading the vertices, reading the textures, and uh, writing to the frame buffer. We opted to go for uh, the textures because it was the most predictable one, and uh, it allowed us to, uh, to uh, have fine-grained uh, and fine, um, fine -grained control over uh, the memory accesses. So we get uh, our first primitive, we get uh, DRAM access, what about a uh, fast uh, cache eviction? Can we bypass the caches fast enough? Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the GPU also has uh, uh, caches, and uh, these caches, uh, um, we need to bypass them uh, as, we, as, as would be the case in the case of uh, an attack uh, run from the CPU. So what we did, uh, we had to reverse engineer these caches because they're undocumented, and they're actually pretty interesting, so if you want, you can ask me a question about it later or look it up on the paper. And uh, what we did was uh, we compared these uh, caches uh, uh, with the one from the CPU to uh, verify how they, uh, uh, what's the difference between the two. And it turns out that uh, the CPU caches are actually pretty large, so in the order of megabytes, and they usually implement a random replacement policy in the case of ARM platforms, which makes it, makes it very, very hard to, uh, to bypass them because you don't know when you're evicting the data that you want to remove from the cache. Whereas this is not the case when, uh, uh, from the GPU because uh, these caches are actually very small in the order of kilobytes. And uh, they implement a FIFO replacement policy, which is uh, deterministic, uh, and as a consequence, it's pretty uh, trivial to uh, figure out what, what you're going to evict from uh, the cache afterwards. And uh, uh, we didn't figure out if uh, these uh, caches were actually uh, fast enough to bypass, and uh, it turns out that actually we can do that. So we have a uh, fast cache eviction, and uh, we are capable of, of uh, triggering Beatrice then. Now, the question that uh, we're still missing is, uh, how do we get contiguous memory to, uh, armor, uh, uh, to perform our ramen attack and have the two aggressor rows and the victim row uh, set in the middle? Now, the idea is uh, that uh, if you uh, allocate enough memory on the, um, on the ROM, uh, eventually the, the operating system will provide you with the contiguous chunks. And this is because uh, at the beginning we try not to fragment the memory, but at one point once you, uh, you have exhausted all the small chunks, you will need to uh, allocate also from the big chunks. So uh, we start allocating single pages textures, and in this case, uh, one page is uh, represented by three of the, these cells, and we start uh, allocating them. At one point, uh, you will end up uh, allocating from uh, chunks which are actually uh, 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 contiguous and we can use for armor. Now, we have one part of it which is, can be used for armor, and one part uh, that is not uh, usable for armor. So the question is, uh, how can we uh, distinguish these two, uh, these two uh, areas? And what we do is actually, we actually build a, a side channel to do this. So we can actually prove that uh, we cannot only build uh, RAM attacks, but also side channels. And this side channel uh, targets uh, the way DRAM reads work. So when you want to read something from DRAM, so let's say you want to read uh, these two pages on that row, what you need to do is uh, you get that row, you activate it, and uh, you bring it to the row buffer, which is kind of a cache for uh, DRAM. And then once it's in the row buffer, you can uh, read uh, the page that you want. And this, uh, the first read clearly is going to be slow because uh, you need to activate it and bring it to the row buffer and afterwards you can uh, get the data from there. But that's not the case for the second read because uh, it's already uh, in the row buffer so you can just read from there and it's going to be quite fast. And uh, using this, this intuition we can actually uh, uh, exploit it to uh, detect, uh, detect the contiguous and non-contiguous areas. And the way it works is uh, we basically access uh, sequentially all the texture we uh, just uh, allocated. And uh, and so like, uh, let's say we want to access the first uh, few textures we uh, were located. What we need to do is uh, we activate the row, bring it to the row buffer, read from there, do the same for the second row, and then again also for the third row. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, this is really slow because uh, every time you're generating these uh, row conflicts, and also it's very noisy because you wouldn't know where these uh, accesses are coming from, so it might be that it's a row conflict or a hit. But this is not the case when you have a uh, contiguous memory because uh, you can simply say, okay, we want to, allocate, and we want to read these uh, consecutive uh, um, five, uh, four pages, what we do is uh, we just activate the row, bring it to a row buffer, and all of them are gonna be in the row buffer, so this is gonna be quite fast. 
And again, so, so this is uh, really fast, and also it provides you with a really clear signal that you can use uh, to, uh, to detect the two, uh, the two different uh, area in memory. Now, this is not really a major contribution uh, in the sense of the, of the side channel itself, but what, we, what really matters is that uh, we can do it from the GPU, and uh, what it provides us, uh, what are the tools that we need to build these attacks? We clearly need timers to do this. And uh, the GPU provides you with timers through the WebGL API, and it provides you two family of timers. The first one is uh, the uh, timers based on uh, the disjoint timer query extension. And these timers are explicit, uh, and, they, and they are really similar to, for instance, clock get time. So you basically ask for a timestamp, and uh, you will get back the result. And these timers provide you a really high resolution. And uh, using some specific techniques, you can bring it down to almost a few, min a few nanoseconds. The second family of timer instead is based on the WebGL sync uh, objects. And these objects are basically a fancy that you, could use to, you can use to uh, synchronize the CPU and the GPU. Now, these timers are not as, uh, uh, as um, precise as the other ones, but uh, they're still good enough because they provide a resolution of less than a microsecond, so you can still use them to, to build such channel attacks. And what's even more important of this is that uh, all these timers bypasses all the current mitigations because uh, no one take into, takes into account uh, the GPU in, uh, in the threat model. So now we have uh, all our timers, uh, uh, all our primitives. What can we do with these primitives? As mentioned at the beginning, the goal was to, pr to build an end-to-end remote uh, Roamer exploit. And uh, we did this uh, targeting the Firefox browser. So let me introduce you to Glitch. Glitch in a nutshell is uh, it runs in five steps, and the first step, as we mentioned, we need to allocate uh, memory enough to eventually get uh, contiguous chunks. Then we can use our timing side channel to detect these chunks. Afterwards, we need to do memory templating, which is basically the act of uh, looking for uh, the exploitable bit flips. So, as we mentioned earlier, uh, once you trigger a bit flips, uh, you can reproduce it later. So, you first look for the bit flips uh, within the memory that you control uh, on the textures, and afterwards, uh, you will reuse it uh, over uh, the sensitive data you want to corrupt. So, as we mentioned, uh, you look for the exploitable bitflips, then uh, you release the memory, and you reuse it with the sensitive data, and eventually you can uh, exploit it. Now, the, the exploit relies on a primitive that uh, is known as type flipping, and this primitive uh, is based on the fact that uh, modern browsers use uh, double uh, precision uh, values to store both uh, numbers and also uh, pointers. So the, in these numbers, there is uh, the prefix of the number, which is uh, 32 bits, and uh, these 32 bits are used uh, as a tag, and uh, if the tag is lower of a threshold value, uh, then it's gonna be considered as a double, otherwise uh, it, it's a pointer. And now, as you can imagine, uh, by triggering a bit flip in this tag, you can uh, just turn a pointer into a double, or a double into a pointer, so you can do both of the thing. So what we do is uh, we use this uh, primitive, uh, and we use one bit flip to uh, turn a, a pointer into a double and break ASLR because once we turn it into a double, we can actually read it uh, from JavaScript. And then once we have a pointer, we can, uh, do a, uh, we can uh, create a fake object and uh, create a reference to it by using the other bit flipper. So we just turn a double that we craft specifically and we turn it into a pointer. So you would think that uh, since you need uh, two bit flips, uh, this uh, might require a lot of time, but actually it doesn't. We run an experiment and we run it uh, for 15 times and it turns out that uh, it runs in less than uh, uh, two minutes on average. So this is actually the fastest uh, exploit, Roamer exploit uh, available from, uh, uh, from JavaScript. And this is uh, even more important because we do it on a platform that uh, before was not even considered possible. So clearly since it's, uh, quite, uh, uh, it has quite a high impact, we, disclosed, we followed the responsible disclosure and uh, we uh, got the help from the, the Dutch and CSC. And then we worked uh, closely with uh, Google to, uh, to propose uh, mitigations, and eventually uh, both Chrome and Firefox released partial fixes uh, against the timers. Now again, as we mentioned in the beginning, everybody eventually targets the timers, so you disable the timers, but more or less you would be able to find uh, new timers probably in the future. So in conclusion, we uh, introduced uh, the GPU, uh, which is uh, a new attack vector. And we showed that uh, by simply shifting the threat model from, uh, the GPU to the, from the CPU to the GPU, we can bypass all the challenges uh, and the mitigation that were uh, uh, now uh, uh, in place. And the lesson that needs to be learned from this is that uh, we cannot really simply, uh, we need to redefine the threat model because uh, if we simply consider the CPU as attack vector, then uh, somebody else can choose to use something different. So in this case, we chose to use the GPU, but next time it could be the digital signal processor or, the, or an FPGA or whatever other uh, units inside the, the, um, uh, the system on chip. So now I have a brief demo.
to show you how the deck works. So on the left side here, you have a terminal, which basically represents the ground truth uh, of, uh, of what happens on the phone. So what I'm trying to do is uh, leak the base address of uh, a library in the Firefox browser. And on the right side, we have uh, the remote console, so we see what's happening on the phone. So we start by uh, allocating memory, as we said before. And on the other side, we're just looking for, uh, for the base address. Now, once we find it, we look for, once we find the, the memory, we just look for contiguous chunks, and eventually we start templating. And we look for the two exploitable bit flips then. Once we get the bit flips, we need to release and reuse the memory. And eventually we start exploiting it uh, by triggering the two bit flips. Now, this is speed up. It uh, this actually runs in around two minutes. But as you can see, probably not sure you can, but uh, you can uh, see that uh, we actually get the same uh, um, pointer from uh, the ground truth and also from our exploit, and we can leak the, the header of uh, the ELF binary. So this is it. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to ask. And uh, if you have uh, any doubts and you want to have uh, more information about uh, the exploit or uh, the paper, you can find it on our web page. Thanks, Pietro. Uh, again, if you have questions, uh, please approach one of the microphones and state your name and affiliation, please. All right. So um, I got one question for you, and that's about, um, in your paper, you talk about plans for mitigations. Yeah. Um, could you tell us, just uh, tell us a little bit more about what's in store and, and uh, maybe some of the experiences with the, the manufacturers? So, well, as of now, uh, also in the paper, we suggest, actually, we are the first one to suggest to disable the timers as a short-term mitigation. But we don't believe that's actually a long-term uh, solution because, uh, again, they disabled them before. We found a new one, and uh, we can keep on going with this game. For Roamer, as of now, there is no solution. But uh, we've been talking with Google uh, on uh, possible mitigations, but I'm not sure I can uh, talk about it now. <laughs> oh, it's your, your next paper? or what? <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Is that a stretch? No, that was a stretch, not a hand. Okay, um, uh, last call for uh, the microphone, but uh, uh, thanks again, Pietro. Thanks for your presentation thanks. and the demo.